Well, welcome to this webinar on generalized linear mixed models, which you can now do in Jump and Jump Pro using this GLMM add-in. So I'm going to talk about this add-in today, but before we get started with really getting into generalized linear mixed models, I'll show you how to run a mixed model in Jump, and then I'll show you how to make these generalized linear mixed models. So generally when we're talking about mixed models and generalized models and generalized mixed models, we think about this in this quadrant where the typical ANOVA and regression are up in this top left corner. These are regular regression ANOVA models where we've got treatment effects that are fixed effects. We've got an assumption of normality in the response. And we call these linear models. And in jump, we use the personality in fit model called standard least squares. So just typical ANOVA and regression. If we add to a fixed effects model, if we add mixed effects, so we add random effects into the model as well, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. Now we have something called a linear mixed model, and we can use the personality standard least squares still for this. If you're using just regular jump, you would then use a random attribute in order to get those random effects into the model to make it a mixed model. Or you can use the special mixed personality if you're using Jump Pro. Either one of these will allow you to include random effects. The mixed personality has some other stuff that you can do that's a, a little bit more advanced, like dealing with repeated measures models. Uh, so if you do have Jump Pro, you have more flexibility here. But even in, in standard Jump, you can use this um, standard least squares with a random effect to fit a mixed model. No problem. Awesome. We can do this in Jump. Also in Jump already natively, we have generalized linear models. So this personality and fit model is GLM, generalized linear models. And this is an extension when we had a just fixed effects model, but we now have a non-normal response. So we're not gonna stick with the normality assumption. Instead, we're gonna use a, a different distributional assumption. But what we have not had in Jump is the combination of these two things, generalizing to non-normal responses plus mixed effects models with random effects. So what we're going to talk about today is this cool add-in, this GLMM add-in, which allows us to put both of those things into one model, different response distribution plus mixed effects. So we're going to talk briefly about what a mixed model is just to uh, make sure that that's really clear why we need this special mixed part of this. If, if you don't need the mixed part, there's already something in Jump to deal with generalized linear models. So why do we need these two pieces together? We're going to talk a little bit about LS means because I think this is a very misunderstood part of the interpretation. We're going to then move into when we have a non-normal response and using the generalized linear mixed models. We're going to talk about how the way that you define a generalized linear mixed model is by knowing what distribution you're assuming for the response, what link function you need to use for that distribution, and then the regular model aspects. Um, what are your variables? What's your response? And then we're going to talk a little bit more about back transforming those estimates and confidence intervals onto the original data scale. Because the point of these generalized models is we've got a transformation function happening. That's that link function. And so to really make the results of the analysis make sense, we really need them back on the original data scale. So we'll talk about that too. So first, mixed models. Mixed models are when you use fixed and random effects in the same model. So we need to make sure that we know what a random effect is. And this actually is a little bit nuanced. There are, are a few different reasons you might call something a random effect. Really, the big two that come to my mind are when you are using a variable that has some levels in that variable, and those levels are essentially a random sample of many other possible levels. And related to that, sometimes things that are blocking factors. So if we um, group some experimental runs into one group, and then we have a different group with different runs, a different group with different runs, and we think there might be similarity within groups or competition for resources between groups, um, then we might expect that to be a random effect. So as an example, imagine that you and I and everybody else that's on, on this webinar right now, uh, we're going to conduct an experiment. We're going to make pretzels. Pretzels are, I think, a very delicious thing, and they're actually a little bit difficult to make, or they're they're more difficult than just a, a cookie mix. 
The trick to making a good pretzel is that you need some kind of an alkaline bath before you bake it so you can get that rubbery texture on the outside. And to get that alkaline bath, some people will use a type of a baking soda and hot water mix to dip the pretzels in. Um, you can also use lye. Um, a lot of older recipes will use lye in the recipe, delicious, wonderful pretzels. So we're going to talk about running this experiment with two different kinds of baking soda or alkaline solution. We're going to be measuring the browning quality of these pretzels to see how well we get that sort of rubberized texture. And we're going to run the experiment um, four times where we get each of the two brands at two different temperatures. So we'll have a brand effect with two levels. We'll have a temperature effect with two levels. So you in your house are going to make your pretzels. We'll do these four runs on four different days. And you'll get a randomized order to use for your combination of brand and temperature. So maybe on day one, you use brand one, temperature two. On day two, you use brand one, temperature one, and so on. So you'll get a randomized order at your house. I'll get a different randomized order at my house. So these other sources of variability or other groupings that are part of the way we're designing this experiment, those are the things that are potential random effects. In our case, you're going to do this experiment in your home and you get your own randomization. I'm going to do this experiment in my home. I get my own randomization. So in this case, we're really talking about three things going on. We're talking about varying the brand, brands one and two, varying the temperatures, temperature one and two, and varying each home. So I'll run four runs in my home. You'll run four runs in your home. Everybody else will run four runs of this experiment in their own homes. So we've got this blocking factor, which I'm just going to call oven because oven um, is going to sort of capture that idea of we're all doing this experiment in a different environment. And so my environment is my oven. Your environment is your oven. And so to think about really what's different between a fixed effect and a random effect is if we think about those three variables, the brand, the temperature, and the oven, can we all in our homes use the same brand of baking soda? Hopefully the answer is yes. We're going to be assigned these. Maybe we're picking them up at the store. Maybe someone is mailing us all our, our um, baking soda brands. But ideally, yes, we can all use the same brands of baking soda. So that's a fixed effect with exactly two levels. We all get the same two levels. What about the same temperatures? Minus some potential variation because our if, if our ovens are not reading the temperature. So minus some measurement error. Yes, we can ask for the same temperatures. I can set my oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. You can set your oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, two levels, exactly the same for all of us. What about the same oven? Can we all use the same oven? No, we can't. So that's the point of a random effect is something that either is a source of variability because of the design of how the randomization has to happen or just the nature of how the experiment is running. So the oven is gonna be a random effect Brand is going to be fixed, temperature is going to be fixed. So here's a picture of the experiment at my house on four different days. So there's my oven in the top left corner on the first day. I'm putting the pretzel in the oven and I've made that pretzel with a certain brand. I'm, I've used white and black to indicate the two different brands of the baking soda with these little packets pouring the baking soda onto my pretzel. So I'll have brand one and time one, for example, on the first day. And then here's the second day, I'll have brand two and time two. And then on the third day, brand one and time two. And on the fourth day, brand two and time one. So I get a randomized order to run these. I follow that randomization and that we hope takes care of any effect that maybe day after day after day is, is has an impact. So the order that you run things in is of course very important. So I ran that experiment in my home. So here's my house right here. And maybe you ran the experiment this way in your home and someone else ran the experiment this way in their home. And in fact, all of us on this webinar, and there are many people listening right now, we all run this experiment. And for simplicity, I'm going to pretend there are exactly six of us. So we'll have a smaller data set. It's a little bit easier to use. So this is our experiment. We've built a mixed model where we have one response, which is this measure, some, somehow a continuous measure of the browning quality of these pretzels. We have the brand, which is a fixed effects with two levels. We have the temperature, which is a fixed effect with two levels. And we have the oven, which is a random effect with six levels. I've chosen that we, we're pretending we have exactly six of us running this experiment. 
So one little caveat, that temperature could be treated as continuous, and that's okay. If I treat it as categorical, I'm treating this like an ANOVA with two factors. If I treat brand as categorical, which it must be, and temperature as continuous, then I've got uh, grouped regression. Um, totally okay either way. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use temperature as two different temperatures. I'm not going to consider any temperatures in between. I'm just going to say, do I want to write my instructions for 400 degrees or 450 degrees Fahrenheit? So on the right, we see a picture of this data set. It's called pretzels. We've got the six ovens. We've got the two brands. It's actually going to be an actual baking soda and a lye. We're going to use the temperature at 400 and 450 Fahrenheit. And then we see a distribution after we've all collected our data of the browning quality. So typical ANOVA and regression types of models, the standard least squares models, are going to have this normality assumption. We're going to be assuming that the browning quality is normally distributed after accounting for these random effects. So sometimes we check the distribution of that browning quality column, but really it's not just the distribution of that response without considering the model that we care about, we really care about the, the distribution of the residuals after we fit the model. So really it's easier to check, it's actually only really possible to check if we're fitting the assumptions after we fit the model. Feels a little backwards, but we're gonna trust, we're gonna hope that we have something normally distributed, we'll fit the model and then we can check the residuals to see if in fact we're meeting the assumptions reasonably well. Now, for this type of model, this kind of typical regression in ANOVA, including even with a mixed model with random effects, that normality assumption is not really strong. We don't have to be really perfect, but we do need to be reasonable to meet it. And when we're not reasonable, that's when we might want to consider that generalized linear mixed model where we allow a different response distribution. In this case, I, I, I'll show you in a moment, our residuals are going to be great. So this model is perfect with just a, a normal response. So let's try it. Let's look at this model. So here I have the pretzels data set. Again, of six ovens, uh, two different brands, two different temperatures, and then the response of browning quality. And to fit this model, I go to Analyze Fit Model. Here's where you see those personalities. So I've already put this model together, so it's coming up as a mixed model, but I could fit this with standard least squares. Um, if I fit it with standard least squares, then I put the browning quality in as the response, brand, temperature, and their interaction in as fixed effects. And when I'm originally fitting a standard least squares, you won't see this random effects tab. Instead, you'll have to take the oven, the random effects, add it to the model, click on it, select it, and use this attributes random effect. That's how you'd add a random oven effect to the model if you're using standard least squares. I'm not going to do that here. Instead, I'll use that fit uh, mixed model. So standard least squares works for the no mixed, just, just simple fixed effects. Let's actually look back at the slides. So way at the beginning, the standard least squares works for this situation, normal response and no mixed effects, but it also works for mixed effects with a normal response. So we can use still use it there as long as we use that random effect. Or the easier thing to do is if you have Jump Pro, use that mixed personality. The other options here are, here's the generalized linear model, which allows fixed effects, different response distribution, but we can't use random effects there. And then our fourth quadrant is we're gonna use that add-in in a moment. So I'm going to use the mixed model because I have Jump Pro on my computer and so I'll have brand, temperature, brand by temperature interaction as fixed effects, oven as a random effect, and then I'll click run. So when I run this model, I see that the uh, points are in fact spread sort of in a approximately normal distribution centered around that best fit line. So I'm actually pretty happy with this. We can explore more residuals. by, for example, saving out the residuals. There's actually a benefit here to running this again with the standard least squares personality because you actually get slightly different output. It's the same exact model, 
but the output will be slightly different from the two different platforms that allow this. So if I run it in the standard least squares, there's actually an option here to plot the residuals. So from this one, I can save them out and then plot them. From, from this one, I can directly plot the residuals. So let's plot, for example, uh, the residuals by predicted. And this looks really reasonable. The residuals are between positive 2 and negative 2.5. That's very reasonable, and they do seem to be approximately normally distributed and centered uh, similar variants across all these groups across the whole. Uh, so we've got basically a just a cloud of points centered around that zero line. So it looks like we meet that rough assumption of normality. We don't have a lot of data, so we can't know for certain if these truly were normally distributed as the mechanism that generated them, but this is very reasonable. So then we can look at the, the results. So again, this was the fit least squares. This is the fit mixed, exact same model, just two different ways of looking at some of the output and some different options from these red triangles. And we see, um, uh, for example, the variance components. So we have the oven variance component and the residual. We see the same thing here um, as we do here. So the oven is 0.35 for the estimate of the variance coming from the oven. The residual is 1.10. And if we add those up, that gives us a total amount of variance of 1.46. So this is great. We see that the oven has some variability. In fact, um, it accounts for 24% of the total if we look at this piece of output over here on the far right. So the oven is explaining some of the variability in our data. So by including it in the model as a random effect, we're able to get a better sense about the true brand effect and temperature effect and brand by temperature interaction. Um, what else would we want to see? We want to see the effects of brand and temperature and brand by temperature. So we'll look at the p-values, for example, and see that they're extremely significant. So we don't want to just use exactly 0.05 and anything that's smaller than that is great and anything that's bigger than that is horrible. That's We don't want to use that strict rule, but we do use this p-value as a piece of evidence that suggests that, yeah, there does seem to be a pretty strong difference between the two brands. And yeah, there seems to be a pretty strong difference between the two temperatures. And yeah, there seems to be a pretty strong difference in the brand by temperature interaction. So we can explore those further. For example, by looking at the effect details. So the effect details show us um, the difference between the two brands. So here's the average, essentially, for the baking soda and for the lye. And then here's the average for the 400 and the 450. And then here's the averages for the four different combinations. Baking soda at the two different temperatures, lye at the two different temperatures. And so here we might actually want to look at the least squares means plot and we will overlay the brands on top of each other. So this plot is very useful for us understanding why the interaction would be significant. So we see here that the effect for baking soda over the two temperatures is a little bit weaker than the effect is for the lye over the two temperatures. The lye actually makes a much bigger difference having it at a high temperature. The baking soda only makes a smaller difference having it at a higher temperature. So the fact that these are not perfectly parallel lines is the reason we're seeing a statistically significant interaction. The interaction is telling us that baking soda versus lye have a different effect at different temperatures, or the different temperatures have a different effect whether you're in the baking soda or the lye. So since there's this statistically significant effect of the interaction, and it's not borderline, we're not, it, it's a really strong, there is, is definitely an effect here of, of a different, um, there's a different effect of the temperature within baking soda and within lye. They're both in the same direction, but it's a stronger effect within the lye. So let's use this information from the interaction as the information we really want to report instead of averaging over the treatment or averaging over the temperature. So one thing that we want to do is we want to think about what these least squares means are. If we go back to the analyze platform and to tabulate, we can actually calculate the arithmetic means of the browning quality at the different brands and then nested, we'll put the temperatures nested inside of the brands. So right now I've got the sum there, I actually want the arithmetic mean so here's the mean 
browning quality for those four conditions. So let's look at the least squares means. Those are identical right now. So 11.39667, 15.215, 4.7716, Right now, our least squares means are identical to the arithmetic means. What happens if we go back to the data table and we delete a few values? So I'm going to take out 14.01 here. I'm going to take out maybe 12.35. So I've got a few missing values now. So now let's rerun this. I will go redo and redo analysis. And let's look at those that interaction plot here. And then let's also rerun this. So now we've got the new output with the new least squares means and the arithmetic means here. So now within the baking soda 400, the arithmetic mean is 11.2 and the least squares mean is 11.156. Hmm. So these are no longer identical. The baking soda 450 is still identical. The lye 400 still identical, but the lye 450 no longer identical. So there's two groups that change. Those are the two groups that contain the two values that were missing. So this is a really important point for understanding. We're, as we do things with these least squares means, I just want to make sure that you understand the least squares means are a wonderful estimate of the sense of the middle of the data. So they're a, a measure of the centrality, but they're not exactly the arithmetic mean in every case. They are only the arithmetic mean when you have a perfectly balanced experiment with no missing data. If you do not have all the treatments showing up in all the blocks, or you are missing some of your treatment combinations, um, so if you have a balanced and complete block design, for example, that's you're not actually seeing every treatment with every block, you're going to start seeing that these least squares means are not identical to the arithmetic means. So just keep that in mind. They are only identical in a perfectly balanced, no missing data situation. So we don't want to talk about these as the averages exactly. We want to talk about these more as a measure of centrality. Um, so we'll try to use the term least squares means. We talked very briefly about how the least squares means are not necessarily the arithmetic mean. This was a different example where um, we were looking at welding metal welding pieces of metal together and use a different metal alloy uh, as the bonding element. So we used copper, we used iron, and we used nickel. Here's copper, here's iron, here's nickel as the three uh, bonding materials and looked at how well they hold those two pieces together, which is the breaking strength. So the higher this number is, the harder it was to break that bond. So it looks like iron was the best. But this is just a plot showing the confidence intervals for First of all, when we fit the model as a mixed model where we had a block as a random effect versus if we fit it with the block as a fixed effect. When we fit block as a fixed effect, we were not able to capture the variance in the same way. And so we actually underestimated the variance in this confidence interval. We really, this is the true model and this was the not treating it with the correct mixed effect. So first of all, point number one, when you have random effects, recognize them and use them as random effects in the model because you get slightly different results. It really does make a difference in what your results will be in the model. So use uh, mixed models when you need mixed models. And then also here's the arithmetic means versus the two estimated means in those two different models. And you can see they're not identical. This was a model that had a lot of missing data and it was a, a, an imbalanced design. So we looked at that and I hope that I, I've really driven that point home that least squares means are not exactly arithmetic means. And we'll talk more about why that matters later.